And then I will introduce you Margit Back Jensen from Aarhus University, who will talk you about the early group housing of calves to improve animal welfare and resilience. Have a nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, welcome. Uh, and yes, we're going to talk about early group housing. And I can just. And, um, and thank you for the uh, welcome. Um, I'm Margaret Bank Jensen, and I'm at the Department of Animal uh, and Veterinary Sciences at Aarhus University at Campus Vibor, formerly known as uh, Research Center Forum. Individual housing prevents social behavior, and individual housing is and has been the traditional way of housing dairy calves. So this talk is going to be a lot about why we should house calves like this in pairs or in groups, uh, in small groups, and not like this in individual hutches or pens with very limited social contact. The questions I'm going to address during this webinar are what are the effects of group housing compared with individual housing? At what age should calves be group housed? And which group size should calves be kept in? But first about the effects of group housing compared with individual housing. When calves are housed with social contact, they form social bonds to each other. Um, and We've shown that the calves, they prefer the company of a familiar calf to an unfamiliar calf when we test them in a test situation like this, where they can choose. And we also saw that calf's preference for a familiar calf was stronger if they've been housed together from birth rather than from um, three weeks of age when we tested them at uh, five to six weeks of age. When calves have social contact, they also give each other social support. And that's, that's evident, for instance, that pair house calves, they reacted less to human restraint and blood, and blood sampling than, in, than individual house calves did. And also when we take a, car, a group housed calf out of its usual pen, home pen and its usual group, it responded less to being taken out of its usual group and placed in a novel environment when it was with a familiar calf, that is a calf from its normal group, than if we removed it from its normal group and placed it in a novel environment with an unfamiliar calf or alone. So that shows that the, the calves, once they have formed social bonds, they also provide social support to each other, meaning that they cope better uh, with stresses and they cope better in novel environments and novel situations. Social contact also affects behavior. Uh, calves that are reared with social contact, they are less fearful of conspecifics or other calves. They approach them more readily, as seen in this picture where we've conducted a test where we see how quickly a calf would approach an unfamiliar calf. And they also, social contact also improves social skills. When calves are housed with social contact, they're more appeasing and less aggressive. When they are uh, finally grouped or regrouped um, compared to calves that are individually housed uh, in the first um, weeks of their lives. In, an, in one experiment, we also looked at how much social contact was actually necessary to achieve this. So we compared calves that were, <clears throat> that were isolated, calves that had only visual contact to other calves, calves that had both visual and tactile contact over and through bars, and calves that were pair housed. And when we looked at their uh, fear for unfamiliar calves, looking at the response that was the latency for them to interact with unfamiliar calves, we saw that the isolated calves had the longest latency to approach and interact with unfamiliar calves. And the calves that had visual and tactile contact, they were intermediate. But the pair house calves had the had the, the shortest the shortest latency. They, that, that is, they were quicker to interact with unfamiliar calves and thus had the lowest fear of unfamiliar calves. When we looked at uh, the, the, the social skills, when we grouped or regrouped calves after uh, weaning, we saw that only pair housing improved the social skills here measured as them being less aggressive to other calves than the calves that had been formerly isolated 
or housed with only visual and tactile contact. And this later, later um, result really shows that pair housing and being able to interact fully uh, is necessary for the calves to develop their social skills. Them being housed in, in uh, individual pens next to each other with co uh, contact through and over bars is, does, not, um, does not develop the, the uh, social uh, skills and social behavior, only housing them with full social contact um, does that. Um, there's also been tests of learning ability of calves that were either housed individually or in pairs or groups. And this picture shows the maze where calves can learn uh, to find uh, milk behind. Uh, in this case, they, they learned to find milk behind a white screen, uh, whereas there was an empty bucket with no milk behind a black screen. And after a while, after some trials, the calves learned that when they, they should go to, to the, the to the left side with the uh, white screen to get the mill. And both individual and group house calves, they showed similar learning in this initial, uh, what we call discrimination task. So both individual house calves and group house calves learned this task. However, when the researchers uh, later on switched um, the placement of the uh, milk bucket, so that where the milk bucket had previously been behind the white, white screen, it was now behind the black screen, then uh, the, the uh, group house calves, they showed uh, better learning ability. So they were better at uh, doing what we call a reversal learning task. And this graph shows, uh, the top line shows the, the pair house calves. So the pair house calves, they took uh, fewer, they had more uh, correct uh, responses uh, quicker than the individual house calves. So that shows that when the task becomes a bit more complicated, then the uh, group house calves, they did better. Another question is, at what age should calves be group housed? And this uh, graph shows results from also from a, a reversal task, that is when calves had first learned one task and then they had to unlearn that and learn, a more, learn another task, which is difficult for them. And this here, uh, these uh, bars show the results of the percentage of calves that were successful in doing that, that were either housed individually, grouped when they were six weeks old, grouped when they were uh, six days old, or had been grouped throughout. And as you show, the, as you see the calves that were grouped throughout, or the calves that had been grouped since they were six days old, they, had, they were more successful in this learning task than individually housed calves, whereas calves that were group when they were six weeks old were intermediate. And this test was conducted when calves were seven to eight weeks old. So there's a benefit, so this, this shows that there's a benefit of pair housing or group housing within the first week compared to six weeks. In another experiment, uh, researchers showed that researchers looked at uh, how much calves responded to um, weaning by vocalization, which is a typical response of the calf to being weaned off milk. And they found that they couldn't find any differences between calves that were individually housed and calves that were pair housed when they were five days old and calves that were pair housed when they were 28 uh, days old, pre-weaning or during the gradual weaning, but post-weaning when the, the milk had uh, completely disappeared, calves that were paired uh, at six days, uh, sorry, at five days of age, they vocalized less compared to calves that were paired when they were uh, 28 days or four weeks old and individually housed calves. So this could be uh, this could be a result of calves providing at the um, the pair house calf providing some social support in the social situation of losing the milk, but it could also be due to um, pair house calves having started to eat uh, concentrate earlier on uh, than the um, individually housed calves. But in any case, there was a benefit of pair housing within the first week compared to uh, five weeks of age. But to get back to this about the concentrate intake, um, several studies have shown that social contact stimulate uh, feed intake and we conducted a study where we found that this was more true among calves 
that were fed a high milk allowance. Um, in, the, in the experiment that we conducted, cows were fed either a, a low milk allowance of five liters per day or a high milk allowance of nine liters per day between day uh, two and 28. And then they were fed a similar uh, milk allowance of five liters uh, from day uh, 29 to 42, and then they were weaned at day 43. And when we, we looked at um, the concentrated intake of individually housed calves and, and pair housed calves that were a low milk allowance, we didn't find any difference. But when we looked at among the calves that were fed a high milk allowance, we found that pair housing stimulated uh, concentrated intake in these calves compared to individually housed calves. Um, so in the situation where calves are not eating so much concentrate uh, in the first place because they fed a high milk allowance, the pair housing actually stimulated um, this concentrate intake. And it also resulted in uh, a higher um, uh, uh, growth uh, among the, the and, and the highest growth among the pair house calves that were fed the high milk allowance. So one of the problems with uh, high milk allowances, which is now uh, recommended, is that it doesn't that, that calves do not eat so much concentrate and it's more difficult to wean them off milk. But social housing might actually uh, help solve that problem. This is a result from another a Canadian study also looking at uh, concentrate intake uh, in, in individually uh, housed uh, calves and in pair housed calves. And this, this uh, graph so nicely shows that the effect of the, uh, of the uh, pair housing on concentrate intake appears um, at the age of five to six weeks when the calves are actually uh, starting to be able to uh, ingest a significant amounts of concentrate. It, it also needs to be said that this uh, experiment shows that calves being able uh, to eat at the same time, uh, as you see on, on the photo, when calves had, but all calves have access to eat at the same time uh, in groups or in pairs, that actually increased concentrate intake compared to when only one calf could eat at a time. And this uh, is due to a, a, a mechanism called social facilitation. So seeing another calf eating stimulates um, the calf to eat itself. That's an important point when, when uh, pair and group housing, calves should be able to eat concentrate at the same time. Uh, social contact also makes calves less neophobic, that is less uh, res res less um, uh, less uh, reserved towards novel foods. Uh, this graph shows uh, the amount of TMR consumed um, when individual and pair house calves are presented with TMR as a novel food. So just to summarize, social contact uh, improves uh, welfare, um, it provides social support, it reduces fear of conspecific, uh, it improves the calf's social skills, it improves the uh, calf's learning ability, and it improves uh, feed intake. So all in all, it makes them uh, better equipped to, um, to sort of cope with uh, changes in, in their, their housing, um, it makes them better fit to interact with social uh, partners uh, later on, and it, and it stimulates the feed intake, which is really important because it, it uh, makes them cope better with the stress of being uh, weaned off milk, basically. Important points is that it must be full social contact. So um, it's not enough that calves can interact socially over and through bars. They have to be housed together. They have to have full social contact uh, for, this, for these benefits to arrive. It can be pair housing or group housing. Um, we've, we found similar effect. All the results I've showed you and many more, they have been uh, collected with calves that have been housed in pairs or small groups. Um, so it's not as if um, more calves, it's not as if uh, more calves are better, it's larger groups are not better. Uh, actually, there's some disadvantages of large groups I'll come back to later. But it, ha and it, it has to be from the first weeks on. 
But what about the first few days? Um, can we can we pair house calves from a uh, few days of age? Uh, maybe that's not uh, always uh, practical. At least there has to be two calves. Um, many in many studies, calves have been pair housed from the first few days, and that has worked well as long as emphasis has been made to to learn the calf uh, to drink milk and make sure that they get their colostrum. But the cow may also be part of the solution. I mean, there many studies have showed beneficial effects of also early contact with the dam. And um, leaving calves with the dam for um, a few days until calves are ready to go into pairs and then later on to groups may be part of the solution. So then to the question at which group size should calves be kept? Um, here we have to look at, uh, at health. Uh, health is an, an important uh, aspect. And lower prevalence of respiratory diseases have been found in small groups compared to large groups. So there were lower prevalences of respiratory diseases in calves that were in groups of less than six calves compared to it's a groups of more than 15 calves and also lower prevalences of calves housing groups of six to nine compared to calves housing groups of 12 to 18. These, uh, these results are based on experimental studies. Also epidemiologic studies have shown that there's a higher, there's a lower risk of respiratory diseases in small versus large groups. So it's really, um, and, and so in some studies, um, in some studies, there's similar. Uh, in some studies, a uh, higher respiratory disease have been found uh, in pairs compared to individual calves. But some studies have actually found similar um, similar risks in the individual housed and pair housed calves. So it's really uh, to do with the size of the group. There's a there's a, um, a scientific opinion on the welfare of calves were adopted uh, last year. And uh, as part of this, um, uh, the work in this scientific opinion, uh, researchers were um, asked to give an evaluation of, uh, based on em uh, empirical uh, science, um, the respiratory disease prevalence per uh, in different uh, group sizes. And uh, this is the resulting data, and it was estimated that there would be a higher a respiratory disease a prevalence in groups over um, seven, anim seven uh, animals per group. So what was elicited was individual pen, pairs, calves house in pairs of three animals per group, four to seven animals per group, 12 to 18 per group, or uh, 30 to 40 animals per group. So the, the, um, the estimated, the estimated uh, uh, respir respiratory disease prevalence increased behind between these two group sizes and that um, uh, resulted in the uh, recommendation from EFSA to uh, avoid individual housing and to keep animals in small groups uh, of two to seven um, calves uh, of similar age to make sure that they have access to uh, social behavior. But there are also challenges uh, in social housing. Um, one of the reasons why calves have tr traditionally been housed in uh, individual pens is that it's easy to, to manage them, and it's easy to check for health. But disadvantages of uh, social housing, challenges of social housing are also cross-sucking and competition for milk. Um, Cross-sucking is when the calves, they suck uh, on the ears, uh, mouth, or body parts, or under the belly of, of other calves uh, after they've uh, have been drinking the milk. Uh, and calves are motivated to suck milk. Uh, uh, sucking in dairy calves is what we call a behavioral needs. Animals have a high motivation to perform the behavior irrespectively of the ingestion of the milk. And if they can't do this behavior, if the behavior is thwarted, this leads to frustration and suffering, for instance, in the form of abnormal behavior and stress responses. That's the definition of a behavioral need. And for sucking in calves, the abnormal behavior is this uh, sucking on other calves' uh, body parts. 
But there's a solution to this problem of cross-socking. If you feed cars via a teat, this reduces cross-socking. The sucking motivation is stimulated by the taste of milk and it's reduced by sucking itself. And calves that are fed via a teat, they spend more time ingesting the milk, they suck on the teat after the milk has been ingested, and they therefore perform less cross-sucking. The teat, so to speak, provides an outlet for their need uh, to suck. Uh, if you want to, there's a, and there's a recent uh, systematic review that we did on milk feeding methods um, that shows uh, this, and this is published in Journal Dairy Science. What about competition then? I mean, competition um, increases with group size. Uh, we found that in groups of six compared to two, calves ingest the milk faster, and there's also a higher variation in milk intake in the group. We found similar results when we compared groups of uh, 24 with groups of 12 in calves that were fed with um, automatic milk feeders. When they were housed in groups of, of uh, 24 compared to 12, they also ingested the milk faster and there was more displacement from the milk feeder. So competition increases with group size. So that's a, that's, that is a, a sort of an argument for keeping group size low as well. But what can we do about this competition? Can we, can we prevent the calves from stealing milk from each other by the way we feed them? We looked at this by comparing uh, feeding of milk in a in separate versus a communal teat bar. So in the uh, separate teat bar, uh, cows, with, cows were allocated each their portion of milk in each their compartment, which is really the same or, or, or sort of equivalent to, to using teat buckets. And each teat was uh, connected to a separate compartment. With the communal teat bar, all teats were connected to the same communal compartment. And what we what we saw when we looked at uh, um, how calves ingested their milk in this situation, uh, we did we we had hypothesized that there would be less competition for milk when they could drink each of of, uh, of their own compartment. But separate compartments did not reduce variation in milk intake. But separate compartments increased what you see on this photo, which is teat switching. As soon as the milk was finished or almost, almost finished when the uh, milk flow started to decrease, the calf would switch to the neighboring seat that still contained some milk. So fast drinking calves would display slow drinking calves. With the communal um, compartment, uh, drinking speed determined milk intake. So, so, um, so actually we found, we found similar we found uh, we found a similar uh, sort of similar problems. It, there was a, there was no uh, limitation in competition in this in this case, and this teat switching is hard to do something about. It's a natural uh, behavior of the calf. It's what also the calf does when it's when it's forage on the other. When the, the flow in one teat starts to decrease, the calf will naturally switch to another teat with milk. So we can't stop them from doing that. Um, unless we put barriers between seeds. Um, we did it in a study where we looked at the behavior of calves and milk feeding behavior of calves when there was no barrier, when there was a short barrier that divided the calves' heads, and when there was a long barrier that divided the calves until behind the shoulder. And when we when and when only with the long barrier where the calves were separated to down behind the shoulder, uh, we saw uh, we, we did, that reduced the number of displacement of another from an, from another calf, and we saw no milk stealing of another calf's pocket in that place. So 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 putting in barriers, they have to be down uh, to the shoulder to prevent other calves from displacing the calf and stealing the milk. Um, there are, I mean, there are other makes on. Uh, there are other sort of like solutions on the market where calves actually go into their individual pens uh, to get the, their milk. Uh, but dividers doesn't have to be uh, that long. They can, but they have to be longer than the separations of the head that you see here. So down to the shoulder line, the barriers has to be. Um, some uh, farmers also use dummy teats uh, to. Uh, 
prevent cross sucking and to provide an outlet for the calf sucking. Uh, but when we looked at the the studies, uh, the scientific studies on this, uh, there was uh, we didn't see that there was no evidence that dormant seeds would uh, reduce cross sucking. There was only a few studies, but still no evidence of the calves of the dormant seeds doing that. So really, um, provided milk via seed buckets to make sure that the calves are under teat. When, so they, to make sure that the calves are under teeth so they get their sucking motivation uh, fulfilled, both while, while ingesting the milk and they stay under teeth after they've been drinking the milk as well. Uh, a short note on uh, milk allowance too. Um, there's a current, the current recommend, recommendation is that calves are fed a high uh, allowance of milk of about eight liters per day. This is data from uh, a study where we collected data on calf behavior uh, through an automatic milk feeder. Uh, and the type of data we get from an automatic milk feeder is that we get, first of all, um, the amount of time here in minutes per calf per 24 hours that the calf spend in the feeder uh, ingesting the milk, indicated by the, the, the green part of the, the bar. And then we then we can then have spent some time in the feeder after it's been drinking the milk, uh, sucking on the uh, the seed to to satisfy its sucking motivation indicated by the yellow part of the bar. And then the calf can also spend some time in the feeder where it enters the feeder, although it hasn't got right to milk, it's not entitled to milk, but it goes into the feeder and see can I get milk now and spend some time there. And when we compared this type of data among calves that were fed a high milk allowance of eight liters per day and calves that were fed a low milk allowance of 4.8 liters per day, we saw that in total calves that were fed the low milk allowance, they spend on a, on a daily basis um, significantly more time in the feeder, which we first found surprising. But that is because they have much more they spend more, much more unrewarded time there. They have much more unrewarded visits where they go and check if they can get more milk because they're hungry. They also spend more time sucking on the empty teat after they finished the milk, illustrating that they that this cross sucking can also be um, due to hunger, uh, trying to stimulate more milk down from the feeder. That's the that's stimulating more milk in the in the dam in the on the cow's udder is the natural function of this behavior, but the calves also do it when they're fed artificially. So, so um, because calves spend more time in the feeder overall when they're on a low milk allowance, the, mo the, the low milk allowance actually increase competition because the feeder is occupied for longer of the day, all other things being equal. But the result also shows that these unrewarded visits is a sign of hunger, and it also shows that non nutritive sucking is also a sign of hunger. Uh, this is the results from uh, the systematic literature review I showed you before, where we looked at the, the literature and looked at, uh, at all these different points or different, uh, it, different studies and looking at how many unrewarded visits are there as a function of daily milk allowance in liters per day. And as you see, there are significantly more unrewarded visits when the calves are fed less than eight liters per day. So like, uh, supporting the uh, recommendation of feeding calves more than eight liters per day, at least uh, in the first uh, weeks. Yeah. So, so the recommendation about uh, group housing of calves would be to keep the calves uh, first with the dam, then house them either individually or in, in pairs, and then house them in groups of up to seven calves uh, in the milk feeding period. And to make sure that the milk are fed uh, via a teat and um, to limit uh, the competition uh, for milk, especially if calves are fed in restricted uh, milk uh, by, by uh, placing barriers between teat buckets. The competition is of course less of a problem the higher the milk allowance the calves are fed. 
And this is uh, all communicated in also a fact sheet uh, that we have produced in the Resilience for Dairy project that you can find also on the home page. Yes, that was my words for now. And now I hope that there's any other questions. Thank you very much, Margaret. Are there any questions? Maria? Um, good morning to everybody. Margit, I'm very impressed about your presentation. And um, for me, it's still a question uh, how we, we can reduce this um, cross sucking or um, suck on the teeth uh, without milk, because our farmers say that um, this will be a big problem. Um, cross sucking is anyway big problem, but uh, if uh, uh, calves stay um, without milk, they will get a lot of air, and this is not good for for stomach. No. So 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 what? How 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 do they feed the calves? Do they feed them in a teat bucket? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and. And what is the problem you say? The problem is air, because if they if they fed milk via a teat bucket, I mean, of course, there, there are different there are different teats. I mean, there there, and sometimes some teats have very big holes, so that the calves actually don't have to produce a vacuum to get the milk. But they but if the, the teats have very big holes, or if the teats are old and very worn, then the holes become too big, and the calves will actually have to struggle to keep the milk a little bit back. Um, the, the better teats are teats where there are smaller holes and where the calves have to produce a vacuum to get the milk out. So one problem, one issue could be the quality of the teats to make sure that the teats are intact and and uh, and use teats with smaller holes rather than large holes and do not use teats with the, some teats come with the cross in the tip and they get very easily worn. So, I mean, I, I would look at the quality of the teats. And um, yeah, if I understand your, your question. Yes, correctly. yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. But still cro cross sucking will be will be problem in the in the pair group or um, also later on in the group with six or seven calves. And uh, Slovenia has small, small uh, dairy farms. It's not so easy to create um, the similar age uh, groups. And what about the milk allowance? Because, I mean, cross-sucking, calves are motivated to suck. I mean, the state, taste of milk motivates the calves to suck. So that's what elicits the, the behavior. But it's, it, but as I also showed uh, with the data from the automatic milk feeders, the calves, they suck more on the teat after milk if they are fed a low milk allowance. And the risk of calves can the calves sucking on other calves is also higher on a low milk allowance. So another thing to look at is maybe um, the milk allowance in the small calves. Yeah. So you, if uh, if I understand, you prefer to have uh, at least eight liters uh, milk or? Uh, yeah, eight liters of milk for the first four weeks at least. Per, per day? Yeah. And then, and then after after four weeks, when the calves can start ingesting um, significant amounts of concentrate, you can then uh, start reducing uh, the milk allowance. But it's important that they get that they get a high milk allowance, and that the eight liters per day—that's for Holsteins. Uh, the studies are made on Holsteins. It's important, especially for the first four weeks, they get a high milk allowance. But about the cross sucking, I mean. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, if it, it feeding via teat, feeding via a good quality teat and intact teat. Um, maybe um, I know that some um, that some uh, also recommend to make sure that the calves have easy access to solid food right after milk feeding. That could also be a, an important aspect. So I mean, and and, and problems with cross sucking has has and especially. In the weaning phase, if cross sucking is intensified in the weaning phase, and if cross sucking persists after weaning, it normally has to do with insufficient um, uh, provision of nutrients. 
So also preparing the calves for uh, the gradual weaning by making sure that they have access to um, lots of access to good and plenty, uh, good quality and plenty concentrate and solid food, and make sure that they have free access to water as well. A lot of farmers don't realize the importance of free access to fresh water to, to ensure um, that their calves tra transition to solid food. So um, that might also be a problem. Because if the calves do not have free access to water, they will not eat sufficient concentrate, they will still be hungry for milk. And they and then they might um and that 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 could also um be behind the problem of the cross socking. Yeah. And do you permit one more question? Uh, yes. our farmers are also uh how to say um they would like to know. What is better to feed uh, or to provide um, calves milk or mi milk replacer? But that depends on the quality of the milk replacer, doesn't it? So, but I mean, as a the the, the whole milk is is always good quality. So I would recommend that if you have problems. Thank you. Someone else who has a question? Maria? Margaret, uh, yeah, so that other people are not so curious than me, but I also have a um, question. Um, how... Um, this system uh, with uh, separate boxes works in practice because I'm afraid that uh, there are still some uh, damages uh, because uh, calves are uh, playing and uh, push each other. You don't think that there are some um, some problems? Um, with the with the uh, with the barriers or the partitions. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but, uh, you yeah. you introduce uh, these boxes where and you oh. talk about short um, yeah. Yeah. barriers I mean, or long. Yeah. yeah. And I if mean, you have long, then I think some damages or injuries can happen in the in the groups. Yeah, I mean that would. I mean again, I realized that putting in structures in a calf pen takes up space, and so if there's not a lot of space already, these structures. Uh, mm -hmm shouldn't be there all the time. It could be something that is lowered down into the pen when the when along with the buckets, for instance, when the calves are feeding. Um, I don't have any pictures of that, but I've seen that in function. Um, so it the, the structures doesn't have to be that they, they don't have to be there. The barriers don't have to be there all the time. They can be there only when you milk feed the calves, I would say. If there's not a lot of space, it's better that they're only put into the pen when you're milk feeding. Yeah. And one more question: cow cow calf system. Yes. I don't think that this uh, influence on the behavior, and e even if cows stay only twelve hours or twenty four hours with calf, uh, then they they create some uh, how to say some connection. And this will influence um, in the way of stress for calf and for cow, I think. So uh, do you understand, is, is your question that when you have cow and calf together for, yeah. for instance, 24 hours, uh, they will be stressed when you separate them? Exactly, yeah. Yes. And there's been, there's been I mean, and that is a concern. Um, and but when you look at the studies, um, when you look at the studies that looked at this, they what is seen is that if, for instance, some studies have compared if they they keep the cow and calf together for uh, twenty four hours compared to four days or twenty four hours compared to seven days, and there they've seen that after four days or seven days there's a stronger response than after twenty four hours. But when people have compared 
immediate uh, immediate separation or separation after six days or separation after um, 24 hours, they found no uh, effects. So it's it's not quite clear when. I mean, the the bond forms the bond the bond between cow and calf it starts forming and forms over the first 24 hour. I would say. I mean, that's where all the very intense maternal behavior is going on. The advantages of of leaving the calf with the cow is that the and that of course has to be an individual. Uh, calving pens because otherwise the cows will disturb each other. So if you have cow and calf together as part of the solution for the first day, it has to be in an in, in, in individual calving pen so that the cow can can take care of the calf undisturbed by other cows. Uh, and here the, 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 the benefits of that is that the, um, the cow licks the calf dry, it stimulates it to get up and, it, and the calf gets started earlier. Uh, and the cow also has the benefit of, because it, the cow has a very strong maternal motivation, the cow has been through maybe uh, eight or 12 hours of labor since sort of the, since, I mean, the, 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 sort of the signs of calving, they, they appear like, they can, a cow can have been in labor for up to 12 hours and they, they need the rest of being, uh, they, they benefit from the rest of being with the calf as well. Um, and I would say that if you, if I would, and the evidence says that it's only after the first 24 hours that the, the response to separation starts being significantly stronger. So, so I would say that it's it's fine to leave the cow and calf together for the first day at least. And 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 farmers have different experiences in in this. Uh, it also depends what you separate them to. If you separate the the calf to a, a pair of pen then then this response might not be as big as if you separate it to an individual pen if you see what I mean and it's just to emphasize that the cat that cattle are social animals and they they respond I mean they 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 benefit from being in their social context so so to say but if you can't have them with uh, I mean if you can't have them with the dam then, then I, I would say it's important to put them in a pair pen as soon as possible, as soon as you have the pair. And of course, I realize that that also depends on the size of the farm and and, and having um, calves of similar age for that to be feasible. So it's a balance. I mean, it's a balance of so so group housing is good, but you also have to make sure that it's that it is uh, small groups and that it's it's age. Um, heterogenic groups. And as I say, I mean, and, and the, for the calf's point of view, one other calf does the trick. I mean, more calves are not better according to the experiments, but the young calves uh, pre-weaning one other calf is social contact and provides social benefits. And, and if you house them in groups of more than seven, you just get the health problems. And also, actually, in if you some some uh, in some systems where automatic milk feeders are used and calves are introduced, at a very young age to larger groups, then you can also see behavioral problems in, in terms of calf, calves being reluctant to interact and reluctant to approach the feed and so on. So I, I, I'm very much, uh, there's been many, very many reasons, both from behavioral perspective and from the health perspective of when you do social housing in the middle feeding period, use pairs or small groups. Thank you, Margit, thank you very much. John Me has another question. Caroline, uh, I saw in the chat a um, question from the Greek. Yeah, there's also, but I have to do one after yeah, the other, okay. <laughs> otherwise it will be too much. Um, John, can you just switch your microphone on? Yes, apologies. Um, Margaret, thank you for a very good, as usual, evidence-based presentation. Um, my question is on group size. Um, you made the recommendation regarding social behaviour that group size should be less than seven. But in reality, particularly on our farms in Ireland, farmers are moving towards herd expansion and use of larger group sizes based on automatic feeding of calves, not manual bucket feeding. So in that context, my two questions are one, how does that marry with your recommendation on social behavior? And two, any comment on an apparent 
increase in abomasal disorders in these calves. I mean, um, yes. I mean, milk feeders. Um, I've also, I mean, I, I chose to, to show some, some results on manual milk feeding today because it's, yeah, because it's, um, Yes, because a little bit at a time. We could also have gone more into the automatic feeding. But as you say, when automatic feeding is used, group size is typically larger. And I, as I showed you, um, I, I think I, yeah, I showed you one result. Actually, the, the actually the 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 recommendation of keeping uh, groups less than seven calves per group in the milk feeding period actually also comes from both behavioral evidence and health evidence. I mean, I also showed you the results of the increased risk of respiratory diseases if, if groups are larger. Um, automatic milk feeding, I mean, automatic milk feeding doesn't have to, to be practiced with large groups. I know that that's the that's that that it's being done like that because it's uh, economic because of economics, um, but I don't. But I, but um, I would very much uh, advocate for a pressure towards um, the um, these systems and the manufacturers of these systems to try and make them work with smaller groups. When I did once an experiment where we had calves with automatic feeders in, act, in either groups of, of 12 or groups of 24. And, and, uh, there was, um, and there was one feeder in each of these two groups. And, and of course, because there was 24 cows with one feeder, there was much more competition for this feeder in the groups of 24 compared to the groups of 12. Um, but but these these automatic feeders they're controlled by central computer units and they can mix um, they can mix uh, milk or distribute uh, whole milk um, from this central unit to more feeding stations so to speak. So I see I would recommend that if you want to use automatic milk feeders because that's easier, then you should practice that still with smaller groups that what's being practiced at the moment. Both for uh, both to protect uh, the young calves, because typically if you use automatic milk feeders, you also introduce the calves very young. And and the young calves do not, they the young calves are take young calves take uh, take longer to learn to use these feeders if there's more competition and they suffer they suffer from competition if there's larger groups and they're more reluctant to interact with other calves if they're in a large group compared to a, a small groups especially the young calves so i don't know if that answered your questions because uh, group sizes of uh, 20 to 40 calves that doesn't go well with my recommendations to say it mildly uh, but i don't see uh, no I, I don't see any reason why group sizes cannot be smaller than they what they are currently when you use automatic milk feeders. Thank does you, that Mark. Answer, does, that, does that answer your first question? Uh, yes, in theory. In practice, there may be issues with implementing these group sizes on farms regarding labour and spring and busyness, etc. But in theory, I totally get your point. Thank you. Yes. Put it. Put in. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it, I've even seen I've even seen some some practice to put in two feeding stations to one large group of forty, which doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I would split that group immediately. I mean, but then you had the question of abomasal uh, disorders. Uh, I'm not sure I understood that question. Yeah, so so um, I, I say an apparent increase. The the disorders are first bloat, second yeah. ulcers, and third torsions often on the same farm and sometimes separate. So I describe them as the abomasal disorder complex. They also occur with buckets and with teated buckets and with automatic feeders, but we appear to see more with automatic feeders with no strong evidence in that, just because there are more calves being fed on automatic feeders. So have you had experience of same? And does any of this um, move towards social housing affect that in any way? 
because uh, of the competition, obviously. So, um, I've not looked at uh, this aspect, and I've I've not come. I mean, I I think you know more about that than I do. So, um, but if it has to do with competition, I mean, then for sure to limit competition, as I also showed here, keeping groups small. I mean, is one. Um, keeping groups small, keeping groups age um, homogeneous, protecting calves um, from competition. Yeah, that would be that would be sort of like the three things that I would say could could potentially also uh, help solve that problem complex. Even though I haven't had, even though I haven't looked into that specific thing, John. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. There's another question from Greg in the chat. The question is, is there any information on recovery from disease in group house calves versus individual house calves? Ooh, recovery from disease, not that, not that I'm immediately, not that, that I'm aware and can tell you about right now, but when you think about sickness behavior, because we have looked at sickness behavior, what what is what what sort of like if an if a calf gets sick, if it gets uh, respiratory disease, if it gets fever, then that will change the calf's behavior, and um, a typical sickness behavior is loss of appetite, um, isolation seeking lying sort of motionless and sort of um, uh, conserving energy and trying to, and have and, and sort of uh, mounting a fever and trying to get well and in that case of course it's important that calves can find uh, a, a sort of a dry and draft free and undisturbed place to sit to sort of express that behavior because it helps them get well so again uh, of course if you have group housing where there's too little space and 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 too much competition that could create a problem. Um, we haven't we haven't been into uh, aspects of space. We could also have gone into that, but of course it, it's important that the calves have enough space, dry uh, bedding, uh, draft free, so they can recover from uh, disease. Also in pair and group housing, I could mention here that that I have um, Canadian colleagues that have looked at. Um, sort of isolation seeking in group house calves. They've actually found that calves use uh, little hides if they are provided uh, in group housing, and that could potentially be beneficial uh, if there's uh, calves that has health problems. Yeah, did that answer the question? Otherwise, come back, please. I can't see the chat, so I don't know if. Oh, okay. So yeah, I don't know if Greg, if the question is answered, it's okay. Maybe otherwise, just uh, yeah, tell something. Yeah. Yes, question is answered. Thanks. <laughs> Some other questions? If not, then I thank you, Margaret, for the very interesting webinar session. I hope everybody enjoyed it and got some new interesting information. I will just put our website link in the chat. There you can find everything about the project, but especially also the publications. Uh, the webinar will be published there. But some information to add maybe you can also find a section of fact sheets where Margaret talked about her fact sheet there you can find that if there are some other questions you can always contact us we will answer as soon as possible and yeah for the rest I wish you a nice day and thank you for joining us
Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. Thank and you. Can, Have a nice day. And I can just say that there's also another fact sheet on the way on providing uh, sufficient water for cars. So keep an eye on that one. Super, super. Fala, thank you.